This conference will now be recorded. Perfect. All right. Hello, everyone. I hope you're all doing well from whichever corner of the state you're just you're calling from. And I see we just have somebody coming in from Spokane. This is your moderator. My name is Elaine O'Neill. I'm the executive director of the Washington Farm Forestry Association in Chehalis, Washington. Thank you so much for joining us tonight uh, for a town hall style com conversation with the incumbent commissioner of public lands uh, candidate, Hillary Franz. She likes to just be called Hillary. Uh, we're just gonna do a few housekeeping details to get started. I know some of you are ca calling in from pretty remote locations and with sometimes tenuous internet connections. Um, so there's also a call in number if you're having trouble with the connection. We've also shut off all the cameras except for mine and Hillary's to improve everyone's chance of having adequate bandwidth for this conversation. Please keep your microphone muted and your phone muted and you do that using star six. This prevents all this background noise. So the way we've organized this town hall, we're gonna give Hillary a few moments to introduce herself. Then I have a whole bunch of questions to ask her. Uh, I, I think we received almost 50 questions for you, Hillary. We don't have 50 questions worth of time. So I picked, I picked some good ones for you. Um, Give you a chance to have most of them answered. We're going to try to put things, keep things on a time timeline, and then we have a timekeeper. John Matson's going to help with the timekeeper and the IT. We have a lot of territory to cover. Questions were from fire, forced health, regulations, incentives, conversion, legislative priorities, partnerships, community engagement. You name it. They threw the they're throwing the kitchen sink at you. So we're going to have some fun. Uh, and to the um, our listeners here, if we didn't cover your specific question, if you didn't submit a question, you think we didn't cover everything, but if we have a few moments at the end, we'll open up the chat for questions. Right now, the chat function is disabled. So relax, sit back. We're going to have a fun hour with Hillary, uh, who's the uh, once again the incumbent can candidate running for the Commissioner of Public Lands. So Hillary, in about five minutes or less, tell us about yourself. It'd be great if you could touch on of all the public offices you could run for why commissioner of public lands and then why commissioner of public lands a second time what excites you about this job yeah excellent well so thank you so much and i really really appreciate this opportunity and of course i would have loved to be there in person when we all i remember four years ago when i had that great opportunity so um, thanks everybody for joining from across the straight state. Now, as you know, I'm actually a third generation rancher, small forest landowner. Um, so this goes way back into my history and my uh, family tradition um, in Pierce County, actually. And we still have the, one of our lands, our uh, ranches still to this day. Um, in my background, I am environmental land use attorney for over 20 plus years, and then I had the great opportunity of running for office in 2016, and it's been one of the greatest honors to serve in this role. Um, I, what I love most about the work here is that, um, one, it touches on every topic. Our lands in Washington State and waters to be over 6 million acres of land. We are in all 39 counties of the state. Our land not only provides huge environmental benefit for salmon and clean water and unbelievable forest and agriculture lands that we depend on in our state uh, for our economy and our environment, but it also provides critical resources for funding for schools, counties, basic health, housing, human services, public safety, all resources and services that are needed even more than ever before when we uh, face the reality of COVID and how it has hit uh, every single family Family, but also every community and resources. I One of the things that I love is this state has historically been a very divided state, East and West, Republican, Democrat, urban, Republic, ur, urban, rural. And in my role, I'm a big believer that division only holds us back, that when we are able to come together and we see the value of every community, of every person, we can create greater opportunities. And I would say in my first four years, I have been very clear about where my priorities lie and what we need to accomplish. First, obviously the catastrophic wildfires that we face in our state. Um, we're year on year in, we continue to see increasing number of wildfires. 2014 through 2016, we saw the worst wildfires in state history where a million acres burned in 2015. 
uh, and, um, and we tragically lost three firefighters' lives. Uh, we have immediately gotten to work changing the way we fight fires, uh, first in leveraging our air resources. The moment there was uh, smoke in the air, initial attack was key. We got those aircraft on those fires to put them out. So we were able to put 90, keep 90% 90 of our fires below 10 acres starting when I came into office. Um, we also pre-position our equipment so we can get on those fires quickly because as we know, time is everything in the midst of fires. And we built a team from local, state, and federal agencies where they were working better together, more collaboratively, and they were training together. So they were coordinating, communicating uh, before fire season even started. In addition to that, built a first ever wildfire strategic plan for the state of Washington. That is the first local, state, and federal agencies coming together to build that 21st century wildfire fighting team because we have truly underinvested in wildfire protection. Uh, the last uh, horrific fires of Labor Day, where we had 600,000 acres burn in 72 hours, that's five times the amount of acres that burned in all of 2019. We were truly fighting with skeleton crews because all the air resources, uh, first, we couldn't fly in the first 72 hours plus because of the hurricane force winds and then the smoke. But when we were able to fly, there weren't any more aircraft to be available because California and Oregon had already utilized all, including all the incident management teams and even firefighters. We have got to become more dependent on ourselves as we see increasing fires with 60% of our fires east of the Cascades, 40% west of the Cascades. We also have to get at the root of the issue, which I prioritized within nine months of me coming to office, develop the first ever forest health plan in Washington State, where we're proactively getting at the root of why we're seeing more significant catastrophic fires. We have 2.7 million acres of forest in central and eastern Washington alone that are already dead and dying, um, and why we continue to spend enormous amount of money and resources fighting these fires. And we built a plan where we committed to treat 70,000 acres a year for the next 20 years in central and eastern Washington. And we've already treated over 220,000 acres just since I got into office, which is a significant increase compared to where we were between 2005 and 2012, where we only treated 30,000 acres in seven years. We are now completing the West Side Forest Health Plan um, to address uh, the issue of forest health um, because we're seeing a changing in the West Side Forest. A part of our plan is not just federal lands, which is the most significant um, area, but it focuses on private landowners, our small horse landowners, our state lands, and our tribal lands. In addition, I have been very much committed to the rural economic development. Uh, Pre-COVID, you could travel the state. Many of you are already aware where we see huge economic challenges and generational poverty that go even before the recession. Um, we, in our role, we generate $325 million of biennium in, in some counties like King County, where only 0.08% of their operating budget for just a blip given their diverse economic base. But in the majority of our counties where they have 7 to 12% unemployment, we represent 40% of their entire revenue base. We have got to be more effective at generating more money in those communities, not only from our lands, but helping grow those local economies to change the trajectory they're on developed a rural economic development initiative where we are working going into the community saying how do we help grow your economic base by one understanding what your greatest challenges are what are your greatest opportunities how do we then be, bring in and in, um, investments that will not only help their economy but also will generate more revenue for our schools and counties based on the land we have um, i'm sure we'll touch upon that a bit um, so you, I you, you, you a lot of different things. Oh no, the, that's a really good summary of the last four years. And um, so we can get to work actually <laughs> implementing those plans even more aggressively. As you know, four years is not enough. There's there is a lot problems. going on. What I want to do is is kind of zero it in though to the small forest landowners that are on the call who have some specific questions that are related to their lands Absolutely. and i um one of them i mean you've touched on all of the the really good work that you've done and as we know that really good work takes a lot of money mm -hmm. and you've done you know yeoman's work in terms of going to the legislature and finding ways to get the money to do the forest health to do the the wildfire the forest health etc 
Can you describe your strategy for effectively working with the legislature? And then there's going to be a couple follow-ups on that. So maybe stick to just a couple of minutes and we'll just go along from there. I mean, the first thing is relationships. If you don't have a relationship with the legislators, you're not going to be very effective. And it takes time to build relationships. So I've traveled the state meeting with legislators in their districts, uh, both east and west, north and south, Republican and Democrat, meeting with each and every one of them to understand what are the issues in their community, what are their challenges, but also then present what are the opportunities based on the land we manage, based on our role uh, when it comes to small forest landowners, when it comes to wildfire fighting, when it comes to geology, when it comes to forest health, when it comes to agriculture. Um, and so first, I spent an enormous amount of time throughout the state pre-COVID, but uh, meeting with them in their district, taking their calls. Each one has my cell phone. And then during session, I spent a lot of time in their offices um, responding to issues they themselves had, their constituents have, but bringing them solutions. The key is not to bring them problems. The key is to bring them solutions. And not just solutions based on the work that we have, but also answering the issues their community has. Um, now, obviously, with COVID, um, we've had to get a little more innovative because we can't just go everywhere, although I've been in a few places, including standing on a horse at Joel Kretz's ranch if you're on social media. <laughs> but the reality is we, what we did is we've actually created virtual tours for the legislators, and we went into every region of our state, and we developed a virtual tour of that region and invited the legislators to participate in that virtual tour. Um, and in that virtual tour, we talked about wildfire, we talked about forest health, we talked about small forest land ownership and also our forest practices. We talked about aquatics, which is our other, we talked about geology and we talked about recreation. Um, and so we covered every one of our sort of six program, programmatic areas in every single one of those regions. And the legislators were invited to each and every one of them. Um, in addition to that, I have about I have calls every single week with legislators because it's about being available and then responding to the issues, but also coming with um, the issues that are front and center. So every single year I have come forward with a small forest landowner package. You know that uh, we've been working in Olympia on that. It's been in every one of my capital budget asks. Last year we got significant funding. It's still not enough. We're going to have to come back every single year for them to actually fulfill their promise and commitment. Um, oftentimes we'll bring in, we bring in a coalition along with it, depending on what the subject area is. If it's wildfire, we'll bring in fire chiefs and local fire district leads, as well as our own agency to fight for resources. If it's small forest landers, we worked with Heather and others to do that. So, you know, just to follow up on that, we know that there's usually the full funding is included in the budget request. Rarely do we get much more than, you know, right. keeping it current. Uh, it, and it always appears to be, you know, appears to be a low priority. I know that Heather works, uh, uh, does yeoman's work there and works pretty closely with you. What can we expect in 2021? Because you have an enormous capital budget ask. So for FREP and Triple F Double P that are part of that capital budget ask, where does it fall out in terms of trying to trying to look at those priorities for 2021 because it's going to be a tough year well we, we know that COVID. oh we know that because of COVID. and so first of all i've already spent an enormous amount of time with the legislators understanding what their issues are and you know this is the biggest challenge I, we can talk to legislators till we're blue in the face and I, i'm in every one of those meetings every single year pitching small forest landers that right now they are a huge part of our forestry base they're a huge part of our economy they're a huge part of our environment and the fact is, especially now with COVID, we are seeing the conversion rate of these lands, which are critical for our natural resource economy and for our environment. We're seeing the conversion. And the Forest Action Plan that will come out this month is going to show the threat of that conversion on the west side. And what I consistently am saying to legislators, you have got to come through with the funding that was committed and promised going back to Triple FP, yeah, right, to be able to find the on what they are owed. The hard part is it is next to impossible to get those legislators to actually commit. Let's look at wildfire research. Wildfire is a perfect example. We got zero dollars in 2017. Even after the horrific fires, 2014, 2015, 2016, where three lives were lost in a million acres. 
It wasn't until 2018 when smoke completely filled the air that the legislature all of a sudden said, oh, we have a problem, right? The crisis is upon us. So I think this is where we every year are trying to come in and show what the threat and the concern is. They don't prioritize wildfire. They don't prioritize natural resources. They don't prioritize small horse land ownership within the issues of housing, transportation, right? Um, education. And we have got to figure out a way how we make it more of a priority. Now, the ways we're doing that is forest health in a way, because forest health isn't just about the dead disease trees, right? It's about true management of our forests and giving the resources to the small forest landowner so they can sustain their owners of that land. So we've been, since that now is of an interest and has caught the news, we're using that to help bring more resources to the small forest landowner couple the work of the family forest and fish passive program the forest right parent easement leverage it for the um the culvert debate right that had to go all the way to u.s supreme court to actually address the fish passage bring in the forest right parent easement program into that the prep program so i want to pivot just a little on this because this and this is going to tie back into that whole regulatory issue uh as you know from the last conversation we had uh uh and ken miller asked you that question about the we're working on this land small force landowner template through the adaptive management program and it's tough sledding mm -hmm. and that means that uh it, it, and they're in the middle of negotiations they're they're trying to figure out how can we both meet riparian function and meet the economic needs of small force landowners and you know we can't get into the nitty gritty of that but we we can say that part of the discussion is you know full funding for FREP, full funding for triple f and going hand in hand to the legislature with all the caucuses including the agencies you know your your agency and the other agencies to try to make that a reality for you know the foreseeable future right um is, do we have your support in doing that? Yeah, we did. Yeah, we gave that support last year. You'll remember when we came out of the June um, the June meetings in Skamania, that was one of the items. And then we put it in our budget and we were absolutely got said to everybody that we're all 100%. Every time we put it forward in our budget, that's our commitment that we are going to be prioritizing it. There's 50 other things that were left on the floor that I had to say I, I couldn't do. When we put it in our budget, this means we're going to go fight for it. We are then fighting for it in the Olympia and the legislature. Now, what we need is exactly what you're saying. All those people that we have, big timber, right? Tribes, environment, we're in that group, right? the C Peace program and said, everybody here, we need to have each other's back. You need to have the small forest landowners back. They forever have not gotten. And you'll remember it, at the end of the meeting, I said, can we get the commitment of everybody here that you're going to help support moving this through in the 2020 session? And I think that we we got a little bit of traction, probably not as much as we need. Um, oh, no. Not. Now, we Distant too, we right? Did the, yeah, we did the UW, uh, the University of Washington got funding a couple years ago, and their report is due out beginning of November, probably the end of November. And we have already talked about running a bill, depending on what's in that report, on sustaining family forests. I already have the title Sustaining Family Forests Act. Mm -hmm. And, you know, last year we ran a, a carbon bill and it certainly seemed to generate, you know, a little bit of pushback from DNR um, saying they said they were doing a carbon assessment and they didn't they didn't want our car, the carbon bill to our this carbon bill somehow mess with that. So what did you exactly what do you exactly plan to do with this carbon assessment that's coming out? Because we're thinking carbon will be part of that story for sustaining family for us. Yeah. Um, so what we completed you your assessment yeah go ahead you what do you up. plan this assessment that would be contradictory to supporting this opportunity for small landowners to have carbon payments and this was carbon payments in riparian zones that they have to leave behind i'm all for i 
all for it. I think there may be some confusion. So we already did our carbon inventory. Our carbon inventory was completed um, back in end of 2019. Our carbon inventory was completed. Um, are you talking about WFPA's carbon bill? The no, carbon we have bill? a there. There is a carbon assessment team that DNR you put together. Sequestration. Oh, you mean the carbon sequestration advisory group? Yes. yes. So the, Okay, so the inventory is already done. We've completed the inventory for all of the state. We completed that in early 2019. A carbon bill went to the legislature. Uh, WFPA, I think your group was part of that, right? No, 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 this is different. We had actually advanced a separate bill. Okay. It did not make, it did not make the cut. And what, okay. And so the carbon, go ahead. And the 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 testimony from DNR was that that was a, it was premature and there was going to be something coming out of this carbon sequestration group that was going to drive that uh, you know that was going to be different. And so I guess the question is, what how your, would it be? Your, tell me what your so first of all, I am all for you going and giving carbon credits for FREP for small forest landowners. In fact, we need to have a majority of our carbon credits going to small forest landowners because they're at the most threat of risk and we need to find more ways to give them money to pay for the services they're providing. 100% supportive, 100% in. Now the legislature had developed, if you'll remember, the Carbon Sequestration Advisory Group came out of legislation that came from the legislature asking us to form the Carbon Sequestration Advisory Group that sets for specifically what they wanted us to do. They wanted to build, bring together a diverse team from academics to big timber, to small forest landers, the environment to the tribes, to truly sort of look at a number of issues from what is sort of a carbon mechanism, what are the ways it would impact or influence the environment? How would it influence small forest landowners? How would it influence large timber landowners? How does it impact the mills? Right, and that report, uh, the last meeting was today for that. I don't know what my team told you about that bill, you know, the work of the, the legislature asked us to do on the carbon sequestration advisory group and how your legislation wasn't compatible. My sense is that that, that work being done brings that broad group of stakeholders together, similar to what we want, the same broad group of stakeholders we want to come together on FREP and triple FP, um, as well as the riparian habitat open space to get funding. And now you have this broad group of support along with the report. It seems like it's perfect timing for that legislation, um, as well as the fact that this coming legislative session, there will be a carbon bill, a huge one, that's coming to the legislature um, that is being put together from the Carlisles and Fitzgibbons to the other. So in a way, the timing will, it's not a short session, it's gonna be an interesting session because of COVID, but you have you have the report that's finished by the carbon sequestration advisory. You have all the work you guys have done on your language and legislation. You have now the legislature saying we are absolutely bringing forward a carbon bill. So it seems like the right timing is now to bring the information and resources together to make sure that your bill gets moved forward. And we're happy to figure out how to make that work because I'm all in for it. That's why. We did our inventory in the first place is how do we create a market and how do we get the money to those who need the money most to make sure we keep our forests forest. Okay. Um, now, we're going to touch very briefly on this regulatory thing on the, the alternate harvest restrictions. You know, we've been in the adaptive management program now for just about six years trying to get this, this template through uh, for west side riparian zones. And Ken Miller has been working like a total trooper, giving yes. up his his entire retirement um, yeah. to do this. Yeah. It's keeping him young. It's keeping him young. So we're not complaining too much. But um, like I said, we're, we're, we're near, we're new, moving towards what we call the uh, the end game on that. And his question to you was, you know, we were promised these alternate harvest restrictions for a smaller, relatively low impact harvest in 1999. And his question was, how can you help us ensure this materializes before we all die? 
Well, so Ken, I'll just say this. I wasn't here in 1999, number one. Uh, there, I know, but there's been a lot of there's been a lot of stuff that has been sitting around since 1999, as we know, like Marvel Mural at HCV, like uh, a broken adaptive management system. Like uh, it wasn't as broken at the time, but it just kept getting more broken. I mean, even our wildfire forest health crisis has been around for a long time. So what I would say to you, Ken, is I'm 100% committed to the template. My team have been working on it with you. I know you put an enormous amount of work. I'm committed to making sure that we get the resources in the small forest landowner program to make it much more easy and um, possible uh, so that you guys are not going through so much work to get uh, the kinds of permits you need, the kinds of protections you need, the kinds of funding you need. It's part of why I consolidated the small forest landowner with Forest Health because we knew we had more money in that so we could really actually get more resources to our, our small forest landowners. So it's being effective in that way. I'm 100% behind getting that template done. Um, and my goal is let's get it done next year. Let's just be done. We don't have time to waste. It's kind of music to our ears. Um, just something a little bit more general. Ken, he knows my number. Here's what happens. Do what Joel Craig does. When you want something, text me and go, it's taking way too long. I have no more patience, Hillary. I want to go into retirement. I'm almost 50 years old. That's what Ken should say. I'm almost 50, Hillary. Because you know he's really only 48. <laughs> Wait till so, you're 77. No, well, you look like you're 48. <laughs> So flattery will get you everywhere. Yes, yes, indeed. So what is the so one more regulatory question? What's the most important thing that you think the Forest Practices Board should be working on right now? You know, I mean, here's where I would go right now. Right now, they're trying to finish water typing. It, it's been going on for way too long. And you know that we have got to get the water typing finished because we've made so much progress. Um, but I think, frankly, the bigger issue is the adaptive management program. You've heard it from me a million times. It is too cumbersome. It's too process oriented. It takes way too long. It's inefficient, ineffective. We waste time. We waste resources. We waste money. We waste goodwill. And I am committed to doing my best to fix it. As you know, the way adaptive management is, the way the system was built was everybody was supposed to come together and work together. So it would create less litigation, less process. Well, it is broken down under people's not coming together, right? The relationships have broken apart. My goal is to do everything possible to set up a new table. And I don't mean different people, but bring in the leaders within each one of those caucuses, right? The smalls, the larges, the environs, the tribes, right? Bring them into it and say, look, if we look back to the past, we would not waste an enormous amount of time and money and resources for what? How do we move forward efficiently and effectively together within the legal ramifications of the HCP, which we are bound to do, um, so that we aren't wasting the rest of Ken's life dealing with this issue or the rest of my life or anyone else's? And, you know, we are putting forward a pretty courageous approach um, as I received a, an email from one of your members, you know, supporters of saying, you know, it's already shown that at least some goodwill has started where progress is being made because people started to walk in the shoes of the small forest landowners and understand the issues and started to say, how do we solve these problems together? We still have a long way to go. Part of that, though, is, you know, what is the most, some of the things is going to be, what's the most important thing on the table for us to be working with? Water typing is already well into it. So part of me thinks, let's just finish it so we can show we can finish something, it, right? As next, um, Ecology has met with me. The clean water assurances are a big deal, right? As you know, and we're gonna have to make, you know, they're the ones holding that over our head along with the feds, right? Um, and they've got a timeline with it. And we've got to figure out how we manage that timeline while also making progress. Good. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to pivot back over to Forest Health. I got this very long and involved question from um, Phil Hess, whom I think you know. He's over in Kittitas. He works on the Forest Health 
uh, uh, he's been on the Forest Health Advisory Committee, he's been on the Small Forest Landowner Committee, and right now he looks at, he works with the Kittitas, Kitta, Kitta oh, I'll, I'll mess up the acronym. Essentially, he's working with their wildfire, the community wildfire stuff, trying to do the improvements. And he's yeah. done a, a bunch of work with the um, Firewise, and he's also done a bunch of work with your DNR cost share program called Forest Health and Fuels Reduction. And so he sends me this this question, and uh, if you don't know Phil, he's a long time forestry consultant. So he he knows the ins and outs of being on the ground, and now he's working in that policy realm and trying to make this happen. He wants to make this happen. And his question was to do with something called the eight inch rule. And if you don't know what that is, I didn't either until he told me. So I'm going to tell you. Um, it turns out that. If trees are less than eight inches, you don't need a forest practices application to do the thinning and clean out the brush. If they're over eight inches, you do. And in the good old days, maybe you could sell an eight inch tree. Now you can't. There's no, there's no mills, so there's no markets. And so what they're doing is you'll do, you'll get this cost share, you'll do the thinning, everything up to eight inches goes, but that's not enough to go. That doesn't really reduce your fire risk. And so it turns out that that seems to be something that's in the forest practices division. It's not in law. So his question was, could, is there a way to support removing the forest practices regulatory constraint for Eastern Washington small forest landowners to accomplish these forest health and fuel reduction projects by changing that forest practices app trigger from eight inch diameter to 12 inch diameter? I tried to negotiate for 10 and he said no. And I like I, I think it's a great idea. Of it. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Now let me just say anything <laughs> we just talked about with adaptive management and trying to change forest practices. It's it's almost I mean it's slow, right? It's painfully slow, but I there may be a way we can change it. Here's what I said to my team. So big picture, I said how do we do our 20 year forest health plan in 10 to 15 years? I literally want to be doubling down. We do not have the time to waste. And so I've said, I want to come with big picture ideas that are breaking down the barriers. The federal government is right now a massive barrier. I signed an agreement so we can do the work on federal land so we can break through some of that challenge, right? But ideally, we are moving our forest health work, the big scale, thousand acre out to the private sector who can do it faster than us, right? And more efficiently. We're also grouping, I would say, we're, gonna, we're looking at, at grouping green merch with forest health treatment products, right? Because it can pencil it out if I don't have all the money we need from the legislature or Congress, right? Because we can't necessarily just wait to get the money and watch it burn, right? So this is a great idea where what I love about this is bring me additional ideas. And that's and so Phil, if you're on, I want you to email me all of your great ideas. So, and I would say this to everybody because not everybody got their question. So if it is a work issue, I gotta be careful, okay? So if it's a work idea or question, meaning this one that Phil just gave, send it to Hillary, H-I-L-A-R-Y dot brands at D-N-R dot wad dot gov. That's my go one. If you have a political campaign, that's another email. Don't mix them. It's a bad idea. But I would say, I think it's a great idea. So let me, I'm going to put it on my list. Um, Cause right now we're putting forward the general different proposals that we plan to bring forward in the forest health work. And we, I would love for you guys to be thinking about other ways that right now, small forest landowners are second largest amount of forest health work that needs to be done. Second to the federal government. We've got to get there faster. We've got to help reach them faster. Got to get the tools and resources. You guys know what that means. This is what you guys eat, breathe, and sleep. So if you have ideas like this one and others, please send them to me. I would I love have another. We have another one. We have another one. And <laughs> yes, we will. We will. Um, we'll share these ideas and we and do the recording, et cetera. But I'll make sure that he gets it. Phil actually couldn't join, so he was really delighted that it would be record. It would be okay. recorded. Another Eastern Washington person sent me this question about uh, changing liability. So I know maybe three legislation legislatures ago, we worked with Tom Bubert to try to figure out how to take a little nibble out of that apple because we 
couldn't actually do any kind of prescribed burn on small landowner lands just because of risk. You know, the liability was just creaming them. And so there was some work there on, uh, we've done a little bit of work, but the question was, will you work to change liability around prescribed burns on small forest landowners' lands um, and so that if they're interested in implementing the tool, they can actually do it without losing their shirt if they get an escape? Because obviously there's all sorts of things in there. And that's a difficult one. That might be a piece of legislation, but I don't know. What, what's your thought on that? That's another question. Yeah, if it's liability, that will take legislation, right? There's no way I can, I can't, I can't address liability without legislation, right? Um, but here's what I would say: I'm all for increasing prescribed fire on all landscapes. We are trying to break down the barriers. It's been uh, challenging, but we're making huge progress on it. Um, I see it as one where ideally, as we're building community resilience, we're doing it at a landscape level, meaning small forest landowner after small forest landowner, including state, including local government, including feds. Um, so I'd be interested in looking at the liability issue as well as other barriers to small forest landowners using prescribed fire. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm gonna follow up. This wasn't one that we received, but it's one that's emerging from this conversation. So the Labor Day fires, or maybe it happened before Labor, Labor Day. The one that, that put uh, the, the suburbs of Portland on standby for evacuation, so I can't remember the name of that fire, turns out that it started on federal land and it was burning for a couple of weeks. I can tell you all about it. It's a pain on my side. Yes, go ahead. And so what can we do here? Because, I mean, they're dealing with the same kind of inept system that says, oh, I can't go put it out because it's in some protected area. What can we do here through the agreements you have, the shared stewardship, what can we do here so that doesn't happen and we don't torch a few towns here? Yeah, so I, so first, I, my understanding on that fire was less about protection. It was that the feds were trying to use this tool Looking back, suppression was what got them into having these heavily dense forests. So now they're trying to use fire, managed fire during fire season to do faster forest health work. Well, that might work at certain times of the year. It doesn't work when the landscape is incredibly hot and dry. And then you have a hurricane force winds, right? That push that fire at an unbelievable pace and scale, right? Um, and so the federal government was using this managed fire tool um, and they have been using it more, and in this case, it went sideways. I'm not a proponent of managed fire unless it's a certain right time of year. Like when we do prescribed fire, that makes sense, right? We use it at certain times when we know there's not going to be these winds. We know that we're going to have enough resources to control and contain that fire, I meaning fires aren't breaking out everywhere, right? We know that we're also going to likely have cooler temperatures, and we're also not doing it in close proximity to communities, right? So there's a number of factors, and the federal government might, you know, has started using this. I will be actually meeting with Vicki Christensen and also our federal delegation about what happened. Um, many have already been reaching out on what happened in Washington State. How can they help and support? Obviously, that didn't take place in Washington, thankfully, but it could have. And so I will be vocal. I mean, obviously, you've seen my face and, as the woman talking on wildfires and resources. And I will be using it to say the federal government cannot be doing this in Washington State, um, given how hot and dry our landscape is, how bad a shape it is, and how limited fire resources we have. It is too threatening for property, for communities, for lives. Do you have, because you are the wildland fighting Organize, uh, firefighting organization in the state, do you have the ability, if there's a fire on their property, to go and put it out, or you have to wait for them? They are lead on those fires, so they are in control of those fires. Just like if we had a fire on our state, we are lead, and they follow our lead and provide support. We follow their lead and provide support. Uh, we can obviously use my voice and my position uh, to first go to them and say, don't do this, to go to the media and say, here's the problem and create an issue. It's kind of 
how we did it when the woman was stuck in the tree and because of the wolves and the feds and the state WDFW and US Fish and Wildlife said, you're not gonna help that woman get out. And I said, yes, we are. Our helicopters are there in 13 minutes and she will be out. And uh, there was a congressional hearing on it. So, you know, sometimes uh, you have to use a certain type of action if you can't get their attention. And, you know, it's gotta be reasonable and it's gotta be the right thing to do. And my sense is when they have a fire that they are letting burn at the wrong time, in dangerous conditions, uh, they need to find a different way to do forest health. It's too risky. I hope that they realize that after the Oregon experience. That's just was just beyond the pale. Um, I plan to make that very loud and clear so that mistake is not made again. Okay. There was another uh, another question, and I think this is um, it's related, but it was more around. Uh, what's your plan for both in terms of how to get the funding and the implication of increasing firewise preparedness in communities, particularly in communities where we have a lot of people moving and they're they're saying, well, if I if I can't go to if I if I'm going to work from home, I might as well be someplace I want to live. And so they're moving to the hinterlands north of Spokane, et cetera, et cetera. And they don't have a clue about this. That's so. What's your role there for, for helping in uh, doing wildland uh, or firewise and preparing communities as well as looking after the force? Who are you partnering, partnering with and how is that working? So we are gonna, I mean, I think Malden was probably the biggest um, visual we have and how critical it is for us to not just focus on wildfire resources and forest health, um, and also grasslands, frankly, because our grasslands in the last two years have been burning at even more acres in, in, in a way for us, um, but also this community resilience. So the I will be coming back with a dedicated funding for three things. It will be wildfire, it'll be forest health, landscape resilient, and it'll be community resilience. And that is because after watching what happened in Malden, and I was there on the scene just within two days of what happened in that community where literally in two hours that entire town was completely destroyed and you could go the main street was completely the city hall the fire station the grocery store the post office destroyed to the foundation you go up into the t the neighborhood postage stamp lots um every single home all that was standing was a foundation and a chimney with the exception on each block was one home completely untouched not an ember on it grass is green, paint's beautiful on the house, trees all standing. The fire literally, even with its fast winds and intense heat, moved around it because they had done the work for defensible space. Same thing when I went to the Cold Springs fire, which was a huge, you know, that thing moved in five hours, 60 miles long because of those hurricane force winds. And you would see complete destruction of homes and then homes not even touched. Grass was green. Trees not up against the house, defensible space. We can and must take action and make sure our communities are resilient to fire. Now, first, ideally, we have to prevent people moving into the wildland urban interface. As you know, a lot has already happened um, before we got to this issue. We have to be one showing the level of risk and making sure our local governments, which they determine the zoning at every county and city level that they are aware of how significant the risk is, that we have communities here in Washington State in worse risk than Paradise, California. And what happened in Paradise can just as easily happen here, and Malden is an example of that. We have a list of over 25 communities that are either worse risk at the same risk or just a little bit shy risk of Paradise, California. Every one of those communities, they should be careful not to be citing any more homes. And you're right, COVID is only sort of exacerbating the movement of people into the woods. Um, so first, we will be having a component in there that uh, trying to help work with local governments. We've already done the mapping and we're completing the mapping of where those high risk areas and where they should be careful not to be moving people in and they should be thinking about their land use zoning as a result, because I can't control land use zoning, as you know. Um, 
And it, the second piece is going to be bringing a FireWise program, but it's actually going to be a wildfire ready neighbors um, where we are working with local fire districts. Our local fire districts are first in the line for fire response, whether it's structure or wildland fire most often. In addition to that, they're a trusted spokesperson in that community. Many of them are already launching their own efforts to make neighborhoods more resilient to that fire. So us, along with FireWise um, and our fire districts, will be launching an effort in key communities that have more significant risks than um, others that really pair along with that Paradise California approach. Um, we'll be bringing the resources and tools, not only what you can do in your home, but how to help small forest landowners. Um, also working with American Forest to be able to get the tool and template so small forest landowners can get there quicker and faster without a lot of process and jumping through hoops. So it's easier for them to get the funding they need to figure out what needs to happen on their land, right? And to get any permitting process that needs to um, work. And then our funding uh, request to the legislature will have uh, funding, increased funding for that for small forest landowners and um, for communities and neighborhoods. And so this is a great segue. We have, you know, about 13 minutes left and I want to do a segue into conversion. There are quite a few different questions around conversion, but there were often around development rights, private property rights, you know, how you think about this. So we're curious to know uh, how you would incentivize small forest landowners, either through a regulatory reform, which is one of the things that, that we're talking about with the template, or financial market-based incentives to stay in forestry versus higher land use values. I mean, if forestry is worth 2,000 an acre and development is worth 20, most folks yep. aren't rich enough to be able to say, oh, I'm just going to give that away. Right. That we, need right. To start, we need to value our forest. We need to value our small forest land owners. Um, and that's what we have not done. I mean, the fact that we started this conversation by trying to get the legislature understand the value and actually put money to our small forest landowners and, and how they're providing resources um, and protection and through triple FP, through prep, through the riparian habitat open space program, right? And we have not gotten much traction as we've talked about for years. Um, I'm a believer that one, we are going to see more conversion. We already had it with population growth, but now with COVID, you're exactly right. And our forest action plan that comes out um, at the end of this month is gonna show you on the west side of the state, how significant that threat is and the highest priority areas. The goal of that is to show the legislature how big the threat is of the conversion of our small forest landowners, right? And COVID's component of it. That shows the problem. It shows the problem at a big scale and it shows it in a visual scale, right? This is kind of what we did with the forest health. We didn't get funding until we brought them a plan with a clear identification of the problem and how much it is already costing them without um, if they don't invest proactively in forest health. The same is true with our small forest leaders. Here's what the problem is. Here's the cost to the environment and to our natural resource economy. If you allow the conversion, and I don't mean allow, but you don't take steps to give resources to our small forest leaders. The resources should be multiple tools. One tool is not going to solve this problem. There should be a tool that is looking at it regulatory, meaning reducing the regulations, not making it so hard on our small forest landowners to keep their land in forestry. There should be an incentive base, right, that helps them be able to make sure that it pencils out, but actually should be even more than pencil out. They should be given a value for the ecosystem services they are providing. Um, and that is what has been missing. And whether it comes, it could come in a carbon context, like we talked about earlier, right? It could come in the TDR program. I, I have worked in it. I've done, I've done a ton of TDRs. They are, they work, but they're not big enough scale is the problem, right? I mean, we've been talking about transfer development. I'm all for it, but I think we've got to have multiple tools in the toolbox to solve a very large problem. Um, and I think it's going to happen. Are there, is there a hierarchy in those tools? Like thinking about how you solve this problem, do you see there, there being a hierarchy? 
in the, in those tools in terms of as incentives, regulatory reform. One of the things that I think uh, the biggest push pushback we get from many of our members is this this idea of losing even more of their private property right. You know, they they want the ability to you know maintain the asset value. They'd love to practice forestry, but maybe their kids don't. Yeah. Maybe their kids don't want to practice forestry and they can't afford to just yeah. put it in long-term forestry uh, because... I would say they're not mutually exclusive. What we need to be doing is working on every one of these tools at the same time, right? So we should be, one, we should be making sure we're not putting heavy regulations on them. We should make sure that we're not disincentivizing them from keeping it as small forests land ownership, right? So don't make it harder for them to keep it in forestry. And then as a regulatory component, that has a process component, that is a permitting component, right? We should be working on all that. That template is helpful, right? Making sure that our regulations aren't being overly burdensome. There's that piece right there. We could be working on it at the same time. We're also trying to get more resources and funding for triple FP and for and FREP, right? That'll add more money into, you know, to that program and more resources. We can also be trying to get more money and also make sure that small forest land ownership is providing the kinds of resources and tools. We were two people when I came into office. We now have more people, right? Because we've been trying to help grow that so we have more people to help our. And we can also be getting at the same time we're fighting for funding from the legislature that is either from carbon approach or some other funding mechanism like our forest health um, funding package, right? So there is, to me, it's not this or that, or let's work on this and then we'll work on this. We should be working on them all at the same time because they're in different programs within our agency or they're in other entities that are responsible that we got to fight in the legislature, right? So it's not one or the other and it's not a prior, we got to fight for all of them. I, I, what I'm starting to smell is a much bigger independent small forest landowner office. As you start talking, I'm like, oh, I, I, there should be some empire building on the small forest landowner side, a uh, small forest landowner office. You know, it doesn't have very many people in it right now. So, well, so we're, we're going to come yeah. um, well, and We've been trying to get more of those resources, but that's why we consolidated the forest health program with the small. Remember, we had forest practices and we had forest health, right? When I came in office, we had one person in the entire agency do forest health, but then we were able to secure 13 million the first biennium for Forest Health, and we got 17 million, right? My goal with the dedicated revenue is that we, so it's one of those now, all forest landowners for Forest Health have gotten, so we can, so we can be effective because most of the small forest owners have a Forest Health work day as well as processing, permitting, and resource needs. Right. right. Health is a large protecting from wires, you know, right? It's a, um, you know, sort of land management tool, as you know. Okay. Um, this was a really sweet one, and this came from one of our older members who was really excited about the, you know, what he had done in his life. He says, how can we incur, what, what, do we need to do what would you think about doing from dnr to encourage younger folks and families to buy and steward forest land in the state well first is letting our kids get outdoors and get out away from their computers so i mean why do i love the work i do i mean i was raised by my grandparents and my my dad a single parent and i spent much of my childhood you know outdoors on landscape um, i raised my kids on a farm it's, you know, a big part of it is making sure our kids are not disconnected from nature. So they actually want to enjoy being it. They want to be on the land and they want to care and steward it. Um, I think we are going to see more younger families moving into the cities. Uh, COVID has now told everybody they can work from anywhere uh, pretty much. Um, and I think a lot of people are going to choose a different lifestyle. Um, my hope is that doesn't mean they're going to create those you know, 10,000 man <laughs> square foot and in the middle of a forest, but not actually still understand the value of those forests for our natural resource economy, right? And we actually maintain 
but I think it's going to start with education. We have been, um, we've actually developed a number of education programs. Um, one, we partner with Klamath School District where we're teaching a class of 25 high school students every single year on how to manage forests with actual management of a forest right in their backyard. Um, where they're learning how to set up the timeline for harvest, they're setting up what, how do you steward and manage it over time, what is the commercial thinning operations that need to happen, how do they create a business model for that, right? Um, we're doing, we've created a curriculum that we're now, where kids, when they go out on our public lands, they're not, they're learning about not just the tree and how a tree grows, but then what a tree is then made into, houses and buildings and how it supports our economy and it also funds our schools, you know. So I think the more we're helping educate and reach them, it's not easy, as you know. Um, more and more people have been moving away from ownership of land. I think COVID is creating a new change that we need to use this moment in time to educate more. One of the things that, that we're learning is that, you know, there, there are folks that, have been tree farmers for multiple generations and they understand that you know you harvest a tree you you plant another one and and maybe your grandkids harvest that one um et cetera et cetera and that seems to be missing in the current even in the people that are are new landowners they they're so afraid to do anything that they don't do anything they, they, they just think, oh, we shouldn't do that because it's going to hurt something, not really uh, recognizing that there's a there's a flow to, you know, the life and, and, and growth of a forest. And part of that, I would say, in my over 30 years of being in forestry is because we have this tension, sometimes it's a flat out fight, but mostly it's a tension between the uh, the, per the perceptions of the environmental community writ large, not, you know, individuals in it, and the forestry community. And I'm wondering uh, what you see your role, because I know you've been involved in the environmental community and now you're involved in the forestry community. What's your role here to, to try to bring, you know, bring some perspective that will allow us to move forward instead of that it has to be this or this? Where well, do you I, see yourself there? Yeah. Well, so I think you can see me. I mean, you guys can read my newspaper articles. You can read my headlines. You can read all, I mean, much, you can read my website, DNR website. Too often we sit here and we sort of say, it's the environment versus the economy. And whenever we're operating from this context that says you cut down a tree, you're hurting the environment, right? And we need to cut down the tree to, to help the economy. We have missed that fact that every single person look around me and i'm looking behind you although all i see is walls every single day we touch wood product from the moment we get up in the morning to the moment we go to bed i mean if everybody remembers when covid hit what was the rate it wasn't bread and water it was toilet paper right right we know how essential wood product is and the most environmentally sustainable thing we can do in washington State is to grow our wood product right here right we absolutely must be not just maintain the force we already have for timber, right? Harvest and for the built environment and our needs, but we actually need to be expanding. We truly need to be expanding how many working forests we have because they're shrinking, unfortunately, now. And we only have more and more people coming here. We have more and more need for that wood product. I've been a big believer and I've been very active in telling people because I get this all the time, especially during campaigns. They're like, I mean, I just had a tree sitter in the Capitol Forest that finally got out today. He didn't want a tree cut, right? I have more protests and challenges on the forest we have, our two million acres, because we're the largest timber, you know, sort of timber company, but we're public um, in the state. And we get every time they're, you know, we're doing a timber harvest, we largely have somebody who's fighting it. They're fighting it because they don't want to look at it out their backyard, or they fighting it because they walk the trails nearby, or they're fighting it because they don't think 80 to 100 year old trees. And the fact is, is that everybody uses those wood products. The most sustainable thing we can do is grow the wood product here in Washington State. Um, it actually- Music to my ears. Yeah, That's I say it all the time. I say it all the time. And here's the other thing. When, if we're not 
If we're not keeping it in working forest, we know what it's going to be. It's going to be subdivisions. It's going to be shopping malls. It's going to be commercial industrial spaces. We've seen it happen all the time, right? How is that better for our fish and wildlife habitat? It's not. It's worse. Right? How is it better for clean water? It's not, it's worse. How is that better for carbon reduction? It isn't, it's worse, right? You know, how is not managing our forests better for reducing wildfires? It's not, it's worse, right? So what we've got to do is get to help those who think that cutting down our tree, right? There are certain areas of our state that are absolutely critical conservation habitat. That's why we have an HCP. We have a very protective habitat conservation plan. That's why we have um, regulations, as you know, in forest practices on our private, right? For salmon recovery, for clean water, right? That's why our federal lands, in a way, have gotten quite large and protected, and now looks what's happened on the forest management side in the wildfires. We have got to help educate the public about what forest stewardship is, what is working forest lands, what is the benefit and value of working forest lands, what is the benefit and value of different ownerships within working forest land, meaning state, large timber, small forest land owners, right? And how do we help the public see their relationship and connection to it, right? Um, I love Sweden, I don't know if you've been to Sweden, but I, I've been to Sweden, and one of the things that was very impressive about Sweden is they have forests there, different type of forest, right? But the forest they have there, they realize if they were gonna actually truly create sort of the most sustainable community, then they should grow everything they use right there, right? And so they actually created a zone where the neighborhoods had to be all built in wood because they didn't have concrete and steel that was naturally growing. <laughs> <laughs> right, but they had lots of trees. And so they built their sustainable harvest plan tied directly to the development of their communities, right? And so everybody who bought that home knew where their wood came from. And they knew why growing that wood was valuable, not just today, but in the future. And that it was valuable not only for the economy and for providing a stable home, right, and neighborhood, but it was also valuable for the environment. And the more we can be making that connection, that's my job, your job, that's all of our jobs to help really raise the flag that when we have a fight over wildfire and climate, forest management is absolutely key. Con making sure we have our working forests in Washington state, making sure they don't burn up, make sure they're healthy and strong, and make sure they help our economy and environment is absolutely critical. Wow. Now we've gone a little bit over 7.30, so if you want any last moments, any last words, and then yes. I think we'll close it out. So thank you. I just wanna say, first of all, I know, I think you had 50 questions and I know we didn't get to all 50. So here's what I would recommend. If it's a work-related question, you should send it to my email, right? So Hillary, H-I-L-A-R-Y, it's one L, dot friends at dnr.wa.gov. And if you can send Elaine the questions, that also helps if you already have them, right? And then also send them to my campaign um, if they're not, if they're more political side, right? Or there might be an issue. Um, and then we, I will uh, do my best to get answers to them, right? And especially bring ideas forward, right? And then I would just say, I know it's been frustrating. We have been every single session fighting. I have made sure that it was a priority. I made sure we're in there in front of every one of our legislators um, working for that. We, we've had some success, but you and I both know it's not enough. We keep putting in 10 million. We're not getting 10 million. Um, what I've been trying to do is be more creative, like in the forest health side, you know, how, because we do have the attention and we do, we are getting those resources. Much of this work is very much tied to forest health too, right? And so how do we get more efficiencies and economies of scale? I think your point of like, okay, let's look at the carbon opportunity. Absolutely. <clears throat> it's key. And so looking for those opportunities of how we move forward, um, getting the promise and commitment that was given a long, long time ago to each and every one of you so that we can actually let Ken retire at least in his last 25 years, maybe his last 50 years, 
and uh, as well as being able to start to focus on some other things. And I'm looking forward to continue to work with each and every one of you. And I appreciate appreciate what you do on the land. I appreciate what you do in your community. And I appreciate working with you at the state level. So thank you. Well, this, Hillary, I have to say, this has been a delight, action-packed as usual, high energy. Really appreciate you taking the time to come and talk with us and talk about your vision for the future and a little bit about what you've done in the past. And we're just looking forward to the future. Thank All you right. so much. Good luck November 3rd. Yeah. All right. All right. Take care, everyone. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. You didn't die. Good job, Elaine. All right, thanks. Bye.